السيد أمين سر دائم لأكاديمية المملكة المغربية السادة أعضاء الأكاديمية المدعوين الأفاضل من أستاذات وأساتذة الأستاذ المحاضر الكريم السيد أليزان مهادي مرحبا بكم جميعا باسم أكاديمية المملكة المغربية وأخص بهذا الشكر الأستاذ المحاضر السيد أليزان مهادي عضو شعبة التكنولوجيا والابتكار والتنمية المستدامة بمعهد الدراسات الاستراتيجية والدولية بماليزيا وشكرا للجميع على تلبية دعوة الأكاديمية لحضور هذه الأمسية العلمية التي تتشرف باستقبال أحد المحاضرين المتميزين في سياق تنظيمها لسلسلة من المحاضرات التمهيدية للدورة السادسة والأربعين حول موضوع آسيا كأفق للتفكير ويشكل موضوع آسيا أفق للتفكير محطة متميزة في توجه الأكاديمية نحو الاستفادة من الخبرات والتجارب الدولية في مختلف جهات العالم ولا سيما في مواجهة قضايا التنمية والتحديد والاندماج في عالم التكنولوجيا المتطورة والعولمة ولا سيما بالنسبة لبلد, لبلد كالمغرب الذي يعيش لحظة تحول عميق أو لحظة تحول عميقة بقيادة جلالة الملك محمد السادس نصره الله نحو تجاوز معيقات التنمية والتقدم بكل حزم وعزم لماذا أيها السادة والسيدات اختيار آسيا أفق للتفكير إنها تشكل القارة المعجزة في هذا العصر فقد كانت قبل نصف قرن قارة متسولة وممزقة ومتعثرة ثم أخذت تنهض وعندما قال نابليون بونابارت حين تنهض الصين سيهتز العالم فالأمر لا يتعلق بنهضة نهضة الصين فقط وإنما نهضة آسيا بكل أقطارها وبلدانها ففي العقد الأخير من القرن الماضي شاع بين السياسيين والاقتصاديين مصطلح النمو الأسيوية النمو الأسيوية السبعة كتعبير عن تجربة الازدهار الاقتصادي التي حققتها هونغ كونغ وأندونيسيا وسنغافورة وتايوان وكوريا الجنوبية وتايلاند وماليزيا لقد اندهش الأوروبيون والولاية المتحدة الأمريكية في طليعتهم أمام هذا التقدم الاقتصادي الذي حققته منطقة شرقي آسيا 
المتمثلة في النمور السبعة كما اصطلح على ذلك إذ ازداد دخل الفرد فيها أربعة أضعاف خلال ربع قرن وإذا استمر تقدمها بهذه الوثيرة فإن ذلك سيشكل تحديا قويا للاقتصاد الأوروبي وها نحن اليوم نرى منافسة الصين لأقوى اقتصاد عالمي ليس فقط منافسة الصين وإنما إجبار أكبر قوة في العالم على تغيير رؤيتها لذاتها وبالتالي فإن آسيا بمختلف دولها وشعوبها تشكل اليوم أحد محاور التاريخ السياسي المعاصر والمحاضرة التي سنستمع إليها لاحقا تقدم أحد النماذج التنموية في شرقي آسيا والمحاضر كما قلت هو الأستاذ أليزان مهدي وهو متخصص في إرساء شبكات المجتمع المدني المتخصصة في قضايا التنمية وقد سبق له أن كان مستشارا علميا لدى الوزير الأول الماليزي وكان الرئيس المؤسس لمنصة لمنصة المنصة الحكومية العلمية والسياسية حول التنوع البيئي وخدمات الأنظمة البيئية فليتفضل الأستاذ الكريم بإلقاء محاضرته مشكورا على ذلك Thank you. Um, Professor Abdel Jalil Al-Jumri, Permanent Secretary of Academy of Kingdom of Morocco, uh, Professor Mohamed Katani, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and uh, bonsoir and a very good evening. First of all, allow me to thank the Academy um, of the Kingdom of Morocco for bringing me to this beautiful country and a beautiful building as well. I think since the visa-free travel between Morocco and Malaysia, there has been quite a lot of interest um, of, of at least at least for traveling to Morocco, but I think um, especially more recently with our foreign office, there's a lot of interest for Malaysia to play a leading role amongst Muslim countries, and this is also enshrined within our new foreign policy framework. So I think it is a very good opportunity um, to, to uh, have this discussion between Morocco and Malaysia. Now, our current Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, as I've mentioned, has, has really showed leadership in terms of, or looking again at leadership in terms of South-South cooperation, as well as Muslim countries, as well as the OIC. Now, Malaysia wants to play a bigger role in this sense, so I hope discussions like this could go on in the future as well. Now, before I begin, let me just introduce to you briefly my institute. Uh, the, I'm, from, I'm a senior fellow at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies. Unfortunately, the acronym is ISIS Malaysia. Um, but we, I, I assure you, we are the good ISIS. Um, we are the first and uh, premier think tank in Malaysia, and, and a lot of our work deals with very broad issues of development as well as strategic issues, such as uh, we are involved in track two diplomacy. Um, one of the key uh, policies that we were involved in before was the Vision 2020, which is still uh, now, of course, in its final year. So my presentation today will broadly be about Malaysia's development experience uh, in line with what we do at our think tank, doing policy research on broad development issues. And um, I'll bring you through more or less a historical walkthrough Malaysia's development and really understand what are the models that were developed in Malaysia and also try to find why, what is the reason between both successes as well as some of the challenges we still face today. Can I get the presentation somewhere? Thank you. Right, I will start with introducing some of the broad development narratives that Malaysia is usually associated with. Um, this is not necessarily true, but just to see what, what are usually the broad narratives that, that Malaysia is associated with, especially from an external point of view. First is that 
many b people believe Malaysia is a, a Asian tiger. I will come back to this shortly because, um, fact, strictly speaking, Malaysia was not one of the Asian tigers. Some people call Malaysia a tiger cub economy, but Malaysia was not actually one of the Asian tigers. Secondly, Malaysia's um, many people have have uh, commented that Malaysia has largely um, not suffered from the Dutch disease. Uh, this is where resources, natural resources, because of natural resources, are the main economy sector. Other sectors are, are more or less neglected. And again, I'll, I'll come back to this. Thirdly, is Malaysia as a moderate Muslim country. Again, I will come back to this. And fourth, that Malaysia has successfully transitioned from uh, colonial pluralism to uh, post-colonial multiculturalism. And fifth is that Malaysia's robust um, and pragmatic economic planning drove, drove uh, Malaysia's successes. So I'll come back to some of these narratives as, as I go on my presentation. Sorry, I'm having trouble technically here. So just um, to put it in con context, if you want to compare Malaysia and Morocco, for example, we have to understand the context of Malaysia. Uh, first of all, Malaysia is a constitutional monarchy. Uh, I think I discussed with uh, uh, the Permanent Secretary earlier that it's quite a unique constitutional monarchy where there's a, it's a federally elected uh, monarchy where uh, the monarch changes uh, every five years on a rotational basis or, strictly speaking, on an elected basis. Um, in terms of economy, Malaysia is known as a small and open economy. Uh, the GDP is about the 37th biggest in the world, and with a GDP, cap GDP capita of US 12,000. Now, Malaysia wants to achieve developed status, which is often put at US $15,000 per capita. In terms of environment, land size, I think land size is uh, much smaller than Morocco, maybe about half, about three, 330,000 kilometers, uh, square kilometers. And Malaysia is also one of 17 mega diverse countries in the world. Demographics, Malaysia's population size is 32, and one of the defining things in Malaysia is the fact that Malaysia's ethnic composition is multicultural, uh, composing uh, mostly of, of uh, Malays or Bumiputra, as well as Chinese and Indian. So the first question that I asked was, or is Malaysia an Asian tiger? Um, and as I mentioned, strictly speaking, I would say no. Malaysia was not one of the original Asian tigers for sure. Um, the Asian tigers are those economies that were uh, associated with export-oriented, high technology. But one of the key characteristics of the Asian tigers was that these were economies that were, um, that were run with low natural resources. So to look at Malaysia from the lenses of a nation Tiger, I think, especially from an academic point of view, would not be very useful. Instead, Malaysia is a resource-rich resource country, and uh, I will show this uh, later. Um, so Malaysia's development trajectory, the story of Malaysia's development, is more useful to be told from a developing resource-rich resource country. And I think that is more uh, relevant, for example, to Morocco, who, who is similar in that aspect. Um, So from the, the aspect of resource-rich uh, country, again, the narrative is that Malaysia did not suffer from what is known as the Dutch disease. Now, the Dutch disease uh, is, um, it came from uh, the term, refers to the adverse effects of the Dutch manufacturing of the natural gas discoveries in the 60s. So here, essentially, the theory is that with discovery of, of natural resources such as oil and gas, um, that sector, although it will expand, other sectors will not. And in this context, Malaysia has not suffered uh, from this Dutch disease, and this has been well documented in, in, in many scholarly work. And this can be seen, for example, in this uh, table here. 
in the 1970s, about um, over a decade after Malaysia's independence, Malaysia was heavily dependent on primary commodities. Um, Malaysia, in fact, was the 12th uh, most dependent, you say, in terms of uh, primary commodities, because 90, 93% of the exports were from primary, primary commodities. Now, in 1990, fast forward to 1990, Malaysia has diversified the economic base, and the percentage went down from 93 to 56%. So here is uh, just broadly the evidence that Malaysia did not suffer from the Dutch disease because Malaysia managed to diversify its economy. Now, interesting here, it's, interestingly here uh, is Morocco as well, had similar numbers. Morocco translation from about 90% in 1970 to uh, 53% in um, 1990. So I don't know what the story is in Morocco, but that will be uh, an interesting narrative as well. So Malaysia's development model or characteristic, I would say, um, I would argue will be based on two characteristics mainly. First, as I mentioned, is Malaysia's natural resource wealth. And secondly, is the fact that Malaysia is a trading nation. Now this is one of the key characteristics that drives Malaysia's uh, development policy. And this is mostly because of Malaysia's strategic location. Um, Malaysia uh, sits within what was the Maritime Silk Road, which has now gained more prominence as well because of China's Belt and Road Initiative. But it's also, if you can see, um, in between the, the, the Malacca Straits, it's, it's considered a chokehold for, uh, for transporting, um, for example, oil and gas. So the strategic location of Malaysia has played a very important role in Malaysia's development trajectory, and I, I will show this uh, further later. Now, the narrative about Malaysia as a, um, as a moderate um, Muslim country, I won't touch on this uh, that much, but the key thing here is Malaysia aspires to be a moderate Muslim country, but also from internationally, um, Malaysia aspires to perceive itself as well as, as a moderate Muslim country. So that's, there has been a lot of um, work from the foreign policy uh, aspect to, to push through Malaysia as a moderate Muslim country. So I would say here, the interesting part is, it is more driven from the foreign policy aspect and then translated into domestic implementation. Now, next one is about Malaysia as a peaceful, multicultural country that, that successfully transitioned from post-colonial pluralism to, to, to multiculturalism. Um, Malaysia is undeniably a very peaceful country. And this is from the Global Peace Index. Malaysia is one of the most peaceful countries in the world, um, ranked number 16. And here is because there has not been much international strife, uh, or sorry, um, much international conflict or internal strife in Malaysia, despite the multicultural uh, context of Malaysia. So in that context, Malaysia is very peaceful and there has not been much uh, problems uh, conflicts related from multiculturalism. But on the other hand, multiculturalism is still a challenge, and I will show this again in my presentation later. Now, in terms of planning, Malaysia does have a very systematic planning system. Um, um, we have uh, what's called um, a five-year development plan. The, the 12th Malaysia development plan is currently being, uh, being produced now, and I'm, I'm also part of the steering committee. Um, we have midterm plans, which is called the outline perspective plans. This could be anywhere from 10 years to, to 20 years. And we have long-term visions, such as the Vision 2020. Uh, the five-year development plans also feed into the budgeting. So this is, uh, many people have studied this, this uh, planning system in Malaysia. Now, when you look at um, Malaysia's economic development and economic um, uh, performance. We have to look through the economic growth over the years. And in general, Malaysia has been achieving above average uh, GDP growth rates from 1970 to the current times. But, but it's important to know that the performance has not been consistent throughout. Of course, no country has, but, but there has certain periods that really uh, had high economic growth and certain periods that are not so much. Sorry, so 
<coughs> something's not happening, I'm working with the slides here, but, but you can see um, some different eras, I would say, in terms of economic performance. From the 1970s to the 19, about 1985, the economic growth was roughly averaging about 5 to 6 percent. And then from 1985, there was a, 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 we'll say, a mild recession. And then from 1985 to 1997 was perhaps the, the, the miracle uh, period of Malaysia where, where the growth averaged about 9%. And then from 1997, there was the Asian financial crisis. You can see the big dip there. And from then on, uh, there's been, um, from 1997 to about 2005, it was about crisis management. And from then on, uh, the rates of growth has been roughly about 5%. Although that's been above um, average, the world average, when you compare with East Asian economies, if you see towards the end, uh, from about 97 to 2005, it's more been just in line about with the East Asian countries. So, so there's been growth, uh, continued growth, but it has been a bit of period of economic malaise, if you like. So, the question is, why did these dips, why did these events uh, occur? Um, and what, what can attribute the successes and, and challenges remaining in Malaysia's context? Now here, from a research point of view, I will look into four um, criteria that, that can be attributed to Malaysia's again, successes or Malaysia's challenges. And these four are, first of all, the, the idea that the economic planning and the economic models were the ones that were responsible for Malaysia's performance. Secondly, there's also a commonly held view that the leadership and perhaps the Mahade factor in particular led to Malaysia's uh, against successes or challenges. Thirdly, it's looking at the responses and the adaptation to, to domestic issues as driving uh, Malaysia's development model. And fourthly, the responses and ad adaptation to global uh, economic factors in particular that, that drove Malaysia's economic model. So in this section, I'll just walk through a kind of historical perspective on uh, the evolution of Malaysian development. I don't want to go too far back, but, but we, we still have to mention the colonial uh, period. Um, due to the strategic lo location that I mentioned, uh, the British used, uh, <coughs> especially uh, countries that were very, uh, or locations that were very strategic, and used them for ports. And this is the three straight settlements, if you can see there. Uh, which includes Singapore at that time, um, Penang and, and Malacca. And later on, because of its strategic location and although it's been used for ports like ship, ship building and ship repairs, etc., later on uh, there became uh, economies there for export-oriented uh, export economies. And this included plantation agriculture in the 1800s. But the key significant shift was in the mid-19th century when uh, tin was discovered and Malaysia became the largest producing tin country in the world. This is significant because from being a port-based economy, the development moved inland. And another important thing here is that um, mostly Chinese migrants were brought in to work at the, the mines inland. So the, the economic activity moved from the ports into inland at this time, and those inland later became the urban centers of Malaysia. And this is a very important part of Malaysia's development going forward. Because physical infrastructure were built uh, to connect these, these newly urban centers. Uh, for example, Kuala Lumpur, the definition, the meaning of Kuala Lumpur is, is muddy estuary or muddy confluence, which, which is named as such because it was a former uh, tin mining um, colony. So this created a duality between the traditional economy and the, uh, the modern sector, for example, the mining. And this duality was also tied to ethnicity. The traditional economy was mainly the natives, the Malays, or what we call in Malaysia the Bumiputra, while the more modern sectors were mainly Chinese migrants at that time. And this duality, as you will see, really shaped Malaysia's uh, development moving forward. So in 1957, Malaysia achieved uh, independence and Tunku Abdul Rahman became our first prime minister and in 1963, Malaysia was, uh, was formed. But the post-independence years, the 
economy, you can say, was um, laissez-faire in the sense that there was not much intervention from state. Um, most of the economy was designed to protect, at that time, business, uh, British businesses, British interests in private sector. And it was allowed, private interests were allowed to expand, essentially, at this time. Again, as I mentioned, private interests at that time were mostly either foreign, British, or uh, Chinese migrants started to have a lot of economic activity uh, inland through the tin mining, etc. So commerce essentially was, um, was driven by both the British and the min minority Chinese ethnic. So the outcome of this was there was a disparity between urban and rural. That disparity is linked to ethnicity, where urban is mostly Chinese migrants, while rural was mostly Malays. And this led to one of the key incidents in Malaysia's history. Although earlier I showed that in general there's not much uh, internal strife or inter-ethnic strife within Malaysia, in 1969 um, uh, we had what, what we regarded as the darkest day in Malaysia, where there was about 600 to 800 reported deaths because of um, uh, Sino-Malay uh, um, sectarian violence in Kuala Lumpur. The riots happened just after the elections in, in, in 1969, where non-Malays, non-natives, won a lot of seats. Now, the problem here was that, first of all, the native Malay, the Bumiputra, felt that they had lost control of commerce. So when the elections happened, the feeling was that they also lost political power as well. Um, so the combination of the two led to um, uh, race riots within the country, and that, again, moving forward, was a significant moment in Malaysia's development. So in 1970s, um, Tun Abdul Razak became the second prime minister, and as well as within 1976, we had a third prime minister, Tun Hussein On. Um, and when they came into power, it re there was a significant shift between uh, the development policy of which was previously laissez-faire. There was more focus, firstly, on distribution, Secondly, on poverty eradication. These are the two pillars that, that are important uh, to address. Um, the political alliances also changed during that time. Oppositions were invited into the coalition. Um, and more significantly, it kicked off this uh, era of what's called the new economic policy in Malaysia. Now, the importance of this new economic policy is that the two pillars, as I mentioned, first, poverty eradication, but secondly, is restructuring society. And the idea here is to break away from the British uh, or colonial legacy of, uh, well, what, which was started as a divide and rule, uh, which divides certain ethnicities to economic functions. So the idea here was to move away from, um, from, uh, well, from society being structured in that way. Um, affirmative action policy was applied here. Uh, and uh, this allowed for more businesses licenses to, to, to Malays. This allowed for um, uh, business ownership as well, uh, belonging to more Malays. One of the key things that happened here as well, there was, there was a rise of state-owned enterprises during this time. Um, state-owned enterprises were, were built to also serve the, the interest of mainly uh, uh, well, Malays and Bumiputra, etc., but also in general for distribution of wealth in the country. There was also a focus on industrialization in the sense that before the focus was more on uh, what we call import substitution, which, uh, which substituted industrials, industrialization that previously we imported, but, but now the focus was more on export-oriented export uh, economy. So the NAP, the key thing here is that the new economic policy transitioned from what was more of a laissez-faire approach to a more bigger role for the state intervening with issues such as distribution of wealth. One thing almost as a side that most people do not probably mention in Malaysia's development is the discovery of oil and gas and as well as consolidating the, uh, uh, the reserves from oil and gas into uh, Malaysia's federal government. So in 1974, um, Malaysia uh, government enacted the Petroleum uh, Act and the key thing here is that Malaysia is a federal country with the Petroleum Act 
the, the revenues from petroleum was mostly at the uh, federal level with uh, only small royalties given to the state. Now, this allowed for the federal level to have more revenue and also fund the state-owned enterprises, et cetera, going forward. So again, this is another very important um, history in the malicious development, which sometimes is not mentioned very much. So the impact of the new economic policy was quite significant. Um, first of all, you can see here the poverty rate reduced from um, about 50% in 1970 to about 37% in, in uh, 1980. Uh, land development area doubled during this time because a lot of the, uh, the there was a policy to give land to the to the landers essentially for poverty eradication and this was mostly from uh, plantation agriculture such as palm oil. National income rose about about four times from about um, uh, nine thousand well nine trillion to to forty five trillion, and merchandise exports grew also uh, in a large amount, but. For the development story here, one of the key things is that the public expenditure also rose during this time, from about 5 billion to RM20 billion. So, so this is one of the key things that, that, uh, that resulted into the next development stage, and I'll explain this later. So in 1981, uh, I think um, many of you are familiar, especially now again with, with, uh, with Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed. He came into power, but he came into power at a time where the primary primary commodities are are, uh, are low. The cost of primary commodities, the price of uh, primary commodities are low, and at a time where this public expenditure was ballooning. So, because of this rationale, Mahathir's idea was to move away from prim primary commodities and really transition Malaysia into what he calls a newly industrialized country, or NIC. So in this sense, Mahathir was, was known as the father of modernization, the, one of the themes of, of, of this conference. But Mahathir's first term can be divided into three separate um, eras, if you like, uh, which is not all, once again, it's, it's not all uh, it's just consistently um, a consistent policy, and I'll show this uh, later. So the first one is, is a focus on heavy industrialization. This is where Malaysia was, was uh, tooted as a tiger cup economy because this followed in line with, with many of the tiger economies to go, uh, to go forward with heavy industrialization. Um, this included setting up steel plants, setting up national car projects, but the ownership at this time was still mainly public. And as I mentioned, the public expenditure was already ballooning, but there was an election in 1982, so the expenditure con continued at this time. Uh, because of this, uh, some of these sectors had to be protected, so, so effective protection rates, uh, rates rose at this time. And one of the unintended consequences of focusing on heavy industrialization was actually the services sector. Quite surprisingly, I don't know if this was intended or unintended, quite surprisingly, the services sector rose to service the manufacturing sector, actually. And um, I will show you later, but if you go on to now, now Malaysia has about, um, if I'm not mistaken, 50 plus, almost 60% of the economy is service sector based. So it signaled a new role for the state where business and the state merged together at this point. Um, but it did, so it did bring some uneasiness, I would say, amongst the business uh, society. So in the midterm review of, of the Malaysia Development Plan, it actually mentioned that uh, the public sector continued to play a leading role in heavy industrialization. However, um, its efficiency was not really, uh, not really effective. So this led to a mild recession uh, of, of a negative 1.1% um, uh, growth rate uh, in, in 1985, and this again happened when external debt was increasing very rapidly and resulted in dissatisfaction uh, from business community about um, government's intervention uh, in businesses where 
uh, many people started saying the business, the government's business is to not be in business. So there were a lot of calls for a less regulated economy at this moment in time. Around the same time, um, the Plaza Accord in 1985, where there was um, uh, um, uh, exchange rate, uh, well, trade war really between Japan and the United States, um, which led to the Japanese yen appreciation. At that time, Malaysia deliberately depreciated uh, the Malaysian ringgit at a time when there was high Japanese yen appreciation. So what that resulted was into uh, Malaysia being an attractive um, place for uh, factories to, to relocate to Malaysia and investment to come into Malaysia this time. So that also coincide, coincided with the calls for uh, more privatization and more liberalization of the economy. And the objectives of the privatization, as you can see here, were to reduce public f uh, financial burden, to promote competition, to stimulate private entrepreneurship investment, to reduce size of public sector, and to contribute to meeting objectives of the new economic policy. One of the challenges here is, of course, only the profitable uh, state-owned enterprises were privatized, and, and this uh, is a challenge that Malaysia still inherits until this moment. But there was also partial lib liberalization and, um, and deregulation that occurred within Malaysia that allowed for uh, both foreign interests as well as the, the Chinese ethnic here to, uh, to be, to, for example, to list the companies in the stock market and so on. So this is the period where Malaysia grew at its most uh, for about 9%, sustained about 9% growth rate between 1985 to 1997. Um, and the per capita gross national product raised from about 1,700 to, to more than 4,000 US dollars. So the GDP growth rate at this time, for example, this, uh, I think at some point it was even 14% uh, growth rate. So here I just wanted to show when people speak about Malaysia's development policy, Malaysia's development growth, this was the period of the highest growth. So we can attribute it mainly to the fact that the response measures during the time when there was um, the Japanese yen appreciation, there was also the look east policy during that time where Malaysia was, uh, uh, the policy, the foreign policy of Malaysia was uh, being closer to Japan and a lot of, um, uh, and the deliberate depreciation of the ringgit to coincide at that time. So I would say that explained the the, uh, the high growth rates of that time rather than other attributes. So there was also a need that was recognized to have a more comprehensive development model. So if you see before uh, the 1990 period, a lot of the, uh, the development models were more based on economic distribution or economic growth. So in 1990, Malaysia released the Vision 2020, and the main concept here is one, focuses on comprehensive development models. Secondly, to me, in my opinion, it's really the belief that Malaysia can become a developed nation. Uh, so a lot of it was psychological in that sense. Uh, during this period with the Vision 2020, for example, the Petronas Twin Towers uh, were built. And that was to show that Malaysia can be a developed nation. So you can see there the nine challenges uh, that were um, designed into the, the policy uh, related in to not just simply economic growth, but also um, more comprehensive ideas such as being a liberated society, being a caring society, and, um, um, and also uh, unity, etc. But the key challenge in Malaysia came after the Asian financial crisis in 1997 because of uh, uh, speculation from um, currency. And this led to the devaluation of, of, of the ringgit. I think about 50% of the value of the ringgit uh, came down at that point. Um, in response, there were strict capital controls to, to, to control the movement of, of the ringgit. Um, and one of the key 
uh, interventions that Malaysia did was they refused actually aid from uh, the International Monetary Fund. And this led to quite a few years of crisis management, quite a few years of austerity from about 1997 until 2005. Here you can see that um, uh, during that time, private investment especially went down significantly, and um, um, public consumption raised th uh, through counter-cyclical uh, spending. And um, up until quite recently, uh, public consumption actually exceeded private consumption during this time. So in 20... Um, 2009, uh, Prime Minister Najib became uh, the Prime Minister. Throughout 1997 until about 2008-2009, I would say Malaysia was in a bit of economic malaise. There was not, you know, the gr growth rates were about f still averaging about 5%, but there was not much uh, development uh, there. And the aim of, of Najib was to con continue to modernize uh, the economy, and he introduced a new economic model. Uh, during this time, and this included a comprehensive approach, once again, to, to development. However, much of the concentration here was on the capital markets, was on financing our way towards development, and the goal, despite the comprehensive development model, was still really reaching this kind of um, holy grail of, a, uh, of US $15,000 um, uh, gross national income. So the new economic model was, was uh, developed in a quite a comprehensive manner, uh, as, I, as I mentioned. It, it also addressed some of the key issues such as breaking the long term of vested interest companies from state-owned enterprises. However, as you may know, um, what happened instead was the opposite. Uh, vested interests started to be more stronger during this point. Of course, uh, uh, former Prime Minister Najib was involved in a huge corruption scandal, the 1MDB scandal, and then ultimately this led to the 2018 um, elections where it was very significant in Malaysian terms because this was the first change of government ever. Um, so the platform the opposition uh, was uh, running was um, really based on the corruption of, of Najib Raza. So the platform was run based on democracy, based on rights and principles, which perhaps was not being focused on by, by a previous development model at that time. Um, in Malaysia, this signal uh, a, a time when, when we, what we call the new Malaysia, Malaysia Baru. And moving forward, I'll just give a bit of um, uh, narration on, on how Malaysia, this new Malaysia can, can move forward. So one of the key issues that perhaps previously was neglected was essentially the middle class. Uh, during the elections, issues like corruption, I think some uh, parts of the, the previous government felt was not a key uh, narrative, key issue within the electoral base, but this was proven to be wrong. And the policies up until, up until now has been driven mostly from an economic point of view, also from a distribution point of view, but we can see the results of Malaysia's current uh, development, um, if you look at it from a sustainable development point of view, Malaysia has done very strongly in terms of especially economy and in terms of, um, uh, of meeting basic needs. So here when we compare with OECD countries, um, just because Malaysia wants to be a developed nation by 2020, we see that Malaysia are very strong in terms of, for example, meeting basic needs such as access to water, access to electricity, uh, also access to education, for example. But if you take education as an example, Malaysia has a really high rate of uh, secondary education attainment. However, if you look at uh, the qualitative side, there is the, 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 PISA, the PISA examination, for example. Malaysia doesn't do very well. So here, moving forward, Malaysia has done very well, I think, in terms of meeting basic needs, in terms of uh, focusing on economic growth. But moving forward, there has to be a more comprehensive approach to development, which was always in Malaysia's development planning, 
but it was not, I would say, successfully implemented over the years. So here are some of the remaining development challenges in Malaysia. Um, first of all, the overarching goal of, of purely being too wedded to GDP, as I would say, uh, still persists. This idea of uh, high income becoming the, the ultimate goal of development uh, still persisted, and this has to change moving forward. The focus on redistribution remains on inter-ethnic distribution, um, and this is uh, a necessity uh, in Malaysia because it's inherited from our colonial past, and this still remains a challenge moving forward. Industrial policy, um, as I mentioned, there was a move at some point in Malaysia to focus on the capital markets rather than on manufacturing and man on industry. And while financial markets, of course, is an important part of development, Financial markets do not, do not uh, invest necessarily in the productive base. So within the current government, there is, uh, an, there is an interest to relook into industrial policy rather than purely focusing on financial services. Increasing growth is also made difficult by international circumstances where there's more, of course, now more protectionist tendencies in the world, and Malaysia as a, as a trading nation, as a small and open economy, this is uh, a challenge that Malaysia is facing at the moment. And also as a more mature and developed society, there's more uh, demand for things such as um, uh, democracy, such as even environmental protection, and these are some of the issues that Malaysia has to deal with now. Um, of course, Malaysia in, in its location and being, again, small and open economy, we also have to deal with great power rivalry. And of course, now everyone is talking about the US-China trade war. Uh, and in China, there's also the Belt Road Initiative, and Malaysia has to uh, deal with some of these issues. So moving forward, the Prime Minister um, will launch, actually, this, this Saturday, I believe, the concept of shared prosperity. So this will resolve some of the distributional issues. This will resolve some of the issues that I mentioned, that a development that is less comprehensive, because there is understanding that we cannot focus purely on achieving a high income, uh, uh, high income target, but we have to uh, focus on distribution. We have to focus on uh, a notion of prosperity that is more comprehensive. Now, the shared prosperity concept is very much in line with the sustainable development concept, so it even includes prosperity in terms of, for example, natural resources, it includes shared prosperity in terms of even speaking about rights. Malaysia is also moving very seriously into the sustainable development goals. Uh, in fact, I'm part of the uh, drafting team for the 12th Malaysia Plan, and uh, for the 12th Malaysia Plan, sustainable development goals will feature quite heavily into, uh, into, the, into the, um, uh, the document itself. Here, for example, is an example of the 11th uh, Malaysia Plan midterm review, where Malaysia mapped out all of Malaysia's um, economic goals uh, and development goals with the sustainable development goals. Malaysia will soon also release a, a roadmap for sustainable development goals, which is phased based on the different development plans. In terms of uh, a values-based model, Malaysia is also looking at Makassid al-Sharia. Um, and here, this is explicitly mentioned within our new foreign policy framework. Uh, it addresses five issues of, of uh, looking at development in terms of faith, looking at development in terms of intellect, in terms of lineage, in terms of resources. Um, again, these are some of the new models that Malaysia is currently looking at. Uh, there's not much detail on it, but there is a recognition here that we need to also move towards a faith-based model uh, moving forward. In terms of uh, industrial policy, Malaysia is looking at the fourth industrial revolution and recently re released the Industry 4.0 policy. Uh, so there is a reignite, well, re re reigniting the interests when Mahathir came back into industrial policy. Um, and there are various uh, efforts now being made, for example, uh, looking into uh, Internet of Things and looking into uh, various areas of the fourth industrial Rev revolution. 
And in terms of addressing strategic concerns, here is where the, the attribution of leadership comes in. I think Mahade, Prime Minister Mahade really um, was put, put Malaysia on the map again when Malaysia renegotiated the Belt Road and Initiative projects. Um, initially, uh, I, I can't remember the figures, but it reduced the figures from uh, about uh, 80 billion to 50 billion, uh, I think, um, um, uh, the project costs. So this is where Mahade showed the world that, for example, you can negotiate with China. Um, you can renegotiate with China, and uh, this is where his personality really and, uh, and leadership comes into play. So just moving to some of the conclusions. Um, some of the main characteristics of Malaysian um, development. First of all, is that Malaysia is a small and open economy. As I mentioned, in fact, Malaysia is one of the most uh, involved or perhaps even the most involved in trade in the world. If you see the diagram there about all the trade, punish, uh, trade agreements in the world, Malaysia is right at the center uh, being involved in you know, TPPA, being involved uh, or now has changed to CPTPA, um, <coughs> ASEAN, uh, the Asian Institutional Bank. So Malaysia is very much involved in all the trade agreements that um, we are party to in the world. Um, Malaysia has also had a strong basic needs uh, approach of development in the past. The focus has always been on social welfare, welfare of the what we call the bottom 40 percent. And Malaysia's distributional approach is quite unique in the sense that it focuses on inter-ethnic uh, distribution rather than distribution purely on the basis of uh, income. One thing that I want to, put to, to highlight here is that the idea that Malaysia is completely um, didn't suffer from the Dutch disease is that Malaysia still has some form of resource dependency because a lot of the services are actually connected to, um, a lot of the financial services are still connected to uh, natural resources, mainly oil and gas. For example, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, we, had, we call Kazana in Malaysia, as well as even the 1MDB was still connected to oil and gas. So there is still a form of resource dependency that we didn't really break away from completely. In terms of industrial policy, most of it was uh, driven from abroad, uh, from foreign direct investments. Uh, so this created a bit of a challenge because Malaysia doesn't have um, a strong industrial class. And this differentiates Malaysia from the Asian Tigers, where a lot of the uh, manufacturing, etc., as I mentioned, actually came from Japan, came from the East Asian countries. So moving forward, there's more of a focus in trying to build an industrial class in, in Malaysia. So going back to the narratives, um, is Malaysia or was Malaysia ever an Asian tiger? I would argue no, Malaysia wasn't an Asian tiger. Uh, from a factual point of view, uh, it, it was actually uh, four or five countries that were said to be Asian tigers, but also from an analytical point of view, it's not useful to think uh, about Malaysia as an Asian tiger because Malaysia is a resource-rich resource country, while the other Asian tigers, they develop despite not having uh, abundance of natural resources. Um, did Malaysia suffer from the Dutch disease? Uh, I think I demonstrated that there was a lot of efforts to move uh, away from dependency on primary commodities, but as I mentioned just now, that there is still some dependency there, uh, especially in the oil and gas uh, sector. Did Malaysia successfully transition itself from post-colonial pluralism to multiculturalism? And again, I demonstrated that partially, yes, there has not been many um, incidents of, of, uh, of conflict. However, we have not, I would say, successfully 100% um, become a multicultural country. This still becomes an issue up until today. Um, and Malaysia is a moderate Muslim country. I think this is uh, uh, largely true, uh, both domestically and in terms of all foreign policy. There is a real focus on Malaysia becoming, being a moderate Muslim country. So, <clears throat> trying to attribute the successes and the challenges to Malaysia's development model. So what are the key lessons we can learn here? I think the main thing we can, we, we can say is that 
it is not a specific model. It is not a specific um, uh, leadership quality. It's not a specific uh, uh, um, specific person, for example. It's not purely just Mahade uh, being there that Malaysia developed in such a way. But I think the key thing is that Malaysia's development was um, affected by certain events, key events that happened. They could be domestic, but they could be also external, uh, especially economic factors externally. So the key thing here is that how Malaysia responded to these events. Um, in many cases, Malaysia responded quite strategically to events that were happening. Um, and this may be because Malaysia, from historically, is a trading nation. So Malaysia always looks out, looks internationally to what is happening, and therefore those responses um, uh, determined how Malaysia uh, formed. In terms of critical path or, or, or history, it also shows that our colonial his history still persists. Uh, many of Malaysia's cha challenges still uh, has to do with the inter-ethnic divide, uh, inter-ethnic distribution. So we cannot still we, we cannot break away from, from this reality and certain policies uh, still have to address this uh, historical legacy. In terms of um, exposure, um, again, Malaysia, one of the key characteristics of Malaysia is being a small and open economy. We have to insulate ourselves from exposure from different countries and um, the ex external factors, factors have been crucial towards Malaysia's development. So in terms of planning, yes, Malaysia has a very systematic planning process. Um, however, when we look at those, some of those responses, there, there has also been many policy reversals as well. So I would say the attribution of, of those successes and challenges is not specifically to the planning, but it's also how flexible that planning can be. So the key message here is that we cannot attribute simply any of uh, Malaysia's development successes and challenges to certain um, models, I would say. But really the key thing is here is how Malaysia responded to certain events. And here if you look at some of the key events and, and the responses, I think will better explain um, Malaysia's current uh, achievements. First, for example, in 1969, as I mentioned, the racial riots that happened in Malaysia, straight away after that, Malaysia had a policy for inter-ethnic distribution uh, of wealth. In 1974, when, when, uh, when petroleum was discovered off the east coast of Malaysia, um, there was a quick response from the federal government to consolidate the revenues from petroleum to the federal government. In 1981, when public expenditure was ballooning, there was a quick response to privatize the state-owned enterprises, especially, and uh, deregulate the economy. In 1985, when, when, uh, when the Japanese yen appreciated, Malaysia depreciated our currency deliberately, and this led to um, uh, manufacturing uh, sector moving to Malaysia. And in terms of 1997, in response to the financial crisis, Malaysia had various capital controls to, to avoid the currency depreciating further. And now we, we come to the 2018 elections, which was run on a platform of more uh, freedoms, more democracy. Malaysia has to respond once again to the different challenges we face now. So just as a conclusion, I think, the, the, the idea here is that Malaysia has been quite adaptive in terms of its governance, and as the world becomes more inter interconnected and complex, I think there's more and more of a need for more adaptive governance. Um, moving forward, adaptive governance is not just about strategic responses, that's something that Malaysia has done well in, but it's also about building the social capital and institutions um, that can deal with many of these things. At the moment, perhaps there has been, these responses may rely on certain individuals, perhaps, uh, or perhaps not, but whatever it is, these response, the ability to respond to, to uh, for the crisis in the future has to be institutionalized. So I think in this context, um, it's where Malaysia's development is. Thank you very much. Shuk.
شكرا جزيلا للاستاذ المحاضر على هذه المحاضره التي وفق في اعطاء صوره يعني افقيه شامله عن تجربه دوله ماليزيا في جعل تاريخها المعاصر حركة دائبة في الانفتاح والتكيف مع التيارات 